Good morning, everyone. Uh, and um, a special thanks to uh, Dr. Mohinder Singh for his uh, kind uh, introduction. Uh, we do go back a long way and, uh, you know, he has been my mentor and always been a guide and I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ranjit, uh, for uh, making me a part of this uh, once again. Uh, hopefully, you know, uh, people should find this useful. So, uh, in fact, uh, I would also like to uh, complicate, uh, compliment uh, Dr. Maria Corazon uh, for a very interesting uh, talk. Uh, this was, you know, extremely fascinating and uh, there was uh, a lot to learn from it, though it's uh, different from my field, but uh, fascinating indeed. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about, you know, the crime investigation platform of the future. So essentially, uh, what happens is that we have multiple sources of evidence. And a lot of it comes from, you know, uh, sources like DNA, for example, uh, you know, you will get evidence from uh, uh, digital, uh, you know, uh, uh, mobile phones, from, uh, you know, emails, from, uh, you know, uh, uh, telephone call records and logs that are there. And a lot of different sources of evidence is out there. But the key thing is that, you know, uh, no uh, crime is complete until you get a conviction. You know, you, you're starting out, you want to, you know, uh, do it. But the end object, objective is to catch the criminal and put him behind bars. So the whole thing is that every piece of evidence that we get, we need to stitch it all together so that we are in a position to put the criminal behind bars. Now, today, what happens is that a lot of investigation is being done and uh, a lot of excellent investigation is being done. And, uh, you know, we're getting uh, fantastic inputs from DNA, from the AFIS, the fingerprint systems, from, uh, you know, uh, there are multiple FRS uh, face uh, matching systems. There are, you know, uh, you know, audio analysis systems. There are, you know, cyber crime investigation systems. There are, you know, devices for extracting data from mobile phones. And all that is a load of evidence that is coming together. And that is what needs to be stitched together to, you know, move forward and build a solid case so that uh, the uh, uh, criminal is put behind bars. But there are a lot of challenges out there. Uh, basically, uh, the law enforcement agencies lack uh, proper investigative tools, uh, witnesses, uh, you know, turn hostile. There's a general apathy and a lack of trust uh, in the police forces, uh, which I'm sure, you know, uh, you will all uh, appreciate. Uh, then, you know, what happens is that uh, we all uh, tend to um, uh, believe that, you know, going to the police is not really going to be useful. So, that usually tends, uh, uh, leads to a lot of evidence not appearing. Now, uh, uh, there may be witnesses that uh, are present at the crime scene or may have you know, witnessed some kind of an act, but they are not going to come forward. They're going to avoid getting involved, uh, you know, when uh, the, uh, because they do not want to you know, get into the hassle of assisting the police, which can be a big burden. So uh, I would say, you know, uh, we, the greatest challenge is, is to capture all the evidence uh, of the criminals and uh, then, you know, to ensure the preservation of the same in a tamper-proof condition and to connect all the information in a legally permissible manner. Now, what is it that the crime investigation platforms of the future need? They are actually expected to leverage advancements in technology and data analysis and then, you know, using this, enhance the efficiency and effectiveness of investigations. So there's going to be a lot of technology that comes in. Uh, there's, you know, we all know and hear about chat GPT practically every day, you know. So this is artificial intelligence. This is machine learning. And all of these are going to be very much a part of the future platforms. Uh, there's huge amounts of big data analytics 
In fact, you know, a lot of crimes are, uh, you know, their uh, offenders can be repeat offenders and uh, they can be multiple victims. So what normally happens is that uh, uh, most of these crimes go unsolved or are, you know, investigated in silos. So when we investigate crimes in silos, you may have evidence, but you may not have the, uh, you know, the suspect or the per perpetrator. So it's extremely important to be able to put everything together, use predictive modeling, and the investigator should be able to use all this to solve a crime. So I'm going to talk about something called the Octopus, which is basically a new development. It's a crime investigation platform. It's a game changer. It's a force multiplier, and it leverages all this, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning to put things together, to make things happen, to help us, you know, catch criminals. So there are all sorts of cases and uh, we've had, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, interesting discussion related to uh, DNA evidence from, uh, uh, you know, rape cases and other things. So essentially, uh, there are all sorts of crimes that are out there and all this data is, uh, you know, all evidences that are, you know, adding up to uh, a person's, uh, you know, uh, uh, culpability for a crime. So, you know, in situations where we have DNA evidence that says that this person uh, committed the crime, and then there is other evidence that proves that this person was perhaps in another country, for example, then, you know, uh, the issue becomes... Uh, how do you resolve the two? And uh, there are uh, situations where, you know, you need to be able to bring in other additional evidence which uh, establishes the person's presence at the scene of the crime, at the time of the crime, so that uh, you can, you know, stitch everything together and say, yes, this person is uh, the criminal and needs to be put behind bars for this. So there could be, you know, a lot of uh, different inputs that arrive for uh, an investigation and each of these will actually add a more uh, weight to the investigation and help in arresting the criminal. So we basically start with, uh, you know, uh, an all-in-one dashboard. Uh, you can examine the crime investigation landscape in a shot. So this is, you know, uh, something that uh, is used to get a big picture view of the whole uh, 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 crime scenario in that particular area. So uh, let's take a look at what happens, you know. Normally, you know, when you do an investigation, you uh, look for relationships, links, and, you know, uh, connections between people between objects, uh, between events. So say, for example, there is a bomb blast, so there are a number of people involved. So they're all connected, you know, those people, uh, they were present at the scene of the crime, or they were also involved in other bomb blasts, for example, or there is a kidnapping, and who is the person present at the, you know, kidnapping spot at the time of the kidnapping, for example, and uh, who are the people who are assisting this, that uh, person, and so on and so forth. So there are links, there are, these are what we call connections between people. Then, you know, uh, there are uh, crime spots. So what happens is that we are, say, looking at a situation where uh, uh, crime uh, is happening. So we have, say, you know, a park where we, you know, if we look at crime statistics, we find that, uh, you know, uh, there are, uh, uh, you know, uh, areas in the park which are, uh, you know, used for committing uh, rapes, for example. So, uh, 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 analysis or an overlay of a map with the lighting effects in that park can be done. And if it shows that those areas are not well lit enough, then the simple fact that we put in, you know, enhanced lighting can actually reduce the incident of crime, incidents of crime. So what happens is that uh, here, you know, this is a simple technology that is actually identifying a way to prevent future crimes. Investigation also continues, of course, but uh, this is something that uh, helps, you know, future victims undergoing the trauma and the things that happen uh, by a simple uh, use of technology to solve these situations. 
So we use, you know, uh, geotagging, geospatial analysis for things like this. So uh, what normally happens is that we are, uh, when we investigate a crime, each crime, each incident happens with an event that comes to the attention of law enforcement. Uh, the way it works is that say there is, a, a, you know, a bomb blast and IED detonation. Uh, that is the first time that the law enforcement may perhaps come get to know that that particular event has happened. And then the investigation starts from that. So that is your first event. However, there may be a number of other events that have already happened. And those events may be, you know, uh, related to uh, this particular uh, incident. But uh, we will perhaps get to know them after this particular event. So uh, the way it starts off is, say, there's a bomb blast. Now, when there is an explosion, a number of people are injured. Then there's an examination of the, you know, uh, the explosives found at the location. You will find, you know, that, uh, say, some, uh, you know, different, different uh, chemical analysis is done. And uh, then, you know, different types of uh, IED, you know, uh, detonators are found, the chemicals used are found and things like that. So that's one way of starting it. But there are so many other, you know, pieces of information as well. The second is, you know, you try and identify who were the people who were present there at the crime scene at the time of the blast or just before the time of the blast. So you use, you know, a cell tower uh, analysis to identify who were the people present at the time of the blast at that location. So that's an event. So what uh, a crime investigation platform does is it works uh, by uh, getting data related to an event and it uh, sequences events one after the other. So, you know, uh, say uh, the, like a kidnapping, for example, the child is kidnapped. Then the second event is, you know, that the, there's a ransom call. Then there's a third event, you know, where, uh, uh, you know, there's an exchange of money or whatever. So the way it works is that uh, there are a sequence of events and each of the events provides an investigative opportunity, you know, different insights and uh, an opportunity to co collect more evidence to build a watertight case. So, uh, and of course, to solve the case and, uh, you know, at times uh, get, uh, you know, positive outcomes. So uh, here is where, you know, uh, the, uh, the methodology that is used in the crime investigation platforms. So this is more easy to explain with a case study. So I'm going to, you know, talk about a child abduction case. Uh, this is under the Indian section 364A, and uh, this is kidnapping for ransom. So just a little disclaimer, all info, anonymized, randomized, any matches with persons living or dead is coincidental. All attempts have been made to sanitize the information to prevent uh, victim identities from being disclosed. Photos used with consent. Okay, so the background is that a child is kidnapped from a school. A uh, 10 year old kid, you, you know, every day in the morning, his uh, driver, you know, drops him off. And, you know, in the uh, afternoon when the school gets over, the kid is picked up. The school gets over about two o'clock ish. So uh, this particular day, you know, the driver uh, uh, states that uh, on the way to the school, his tire got punctured and uh, he got delayed a little bit. So when he reaches there, he finds that the kid is not waiting and he's, you know, looks around, asks around and nobody knows and he can't see the child. So he calls the child's mother. The child's mother panics and, you know, the parents of the child rush, reach the, rush to the school and they do not find the child. And then, you know, they contact the police and a search starts. So this is what we call event one, the first event which, you know, the police has got to know and, uh, you know, and a search is started. Now, what happens is that uh, we will, you know, classify this as event one, as I mentioned. Now, what happens is that we start collecting information from now the, this crime scene, which is the gate of the school. And uh, what normally happens is that, you know, uh, we collect the information related to, uh, you know, any witnesses, if they were there, uh, you know, the police tend to ask a number of people. One of the classmates of the child says that I saw the child, you know, uh, getting into uh, uh, a white Wagonar car 
uh, with no number plate, you know. So uh, then, you know, CCTV footage <coughs> is requested from the uh, school uh, gate cameras. And then there is, you know, a white uh, car also seen. And I'll show you all that with no number plate. So the uh, process is, and uh, it's a structured process. The process is to identify all the people who were present at that crime scene at, on the day of the crime and in the approximate time, you know, period of the crime. So if the child uh, school gets over at 2 p.m., uh, the time, you know, is between, say, 2 and 2.30 p.m., we expect that uh, the persons would be there. Maybe, you know, quarter to two, perhaps, or maybe even, you know, 1.30 to uh, 2.30, we can say, is the general time period when a person was present. Then, you know, we also uh, see the CCTV footage uh, we also identify uh, and, you know, as part of the questioning process, we speak to uh, the uh, uh, parents of the child and other members and we say, uh, who could be the possible persons of interest for us? So uh, we, we will say, you know, okay, who are the people who work for you? What about this driver, you know, who very conveniently had a puncture? Who are the other people who work in your, uh, you know, uh, uh, house household? Who are the people who work in your organization? Who are your, uh, you know, friends? Who are your family members? Uh, who are your uh, uh, competitors, for example? So, so there are, you know, a bunch of possible uh, names that we collect just from a perspective of trying to identify uh, when we get the data to identify the presence of those people at the crime scene. So the next technology that comes into play is what we call a cell site analyzer. A cell site analyzer is actually a pretty sophisticated piece of technology, which is very simple to use. Uh, and that's required, you know, when police uh, are, you know, actually uh, operationalizing technology, they need to be able to use it very fast. So uh, the key is that you just take this to the crime scene and you uh, started off to look for the cellular towers that cover the crime scene. So our objective is to identify what are the cell towers that are in that area which are accessible to any mobile phone that is present. So you have a cell phone in your pocket and you all know that the cell phone is talking to different cell towers in the vicinity. So here, this device will list out all the cell towers in the vicinity. So uh, the assumption is that the criminal will also have a mobile phone or criminal and his accomplices or whatever. And that mobile phone is perhaps being used to say converse with someone in this waiting period of one hour or to send text messages or even to receive text messages or even, you know, to uh, say use the internet or even inadvertently because the phone automatically keeps sending and receiving messages, checking WhatsApps, for example, or even, you know, updating, uh, uh, you know, times because what happens is that the date and time is synced with say uh, an NTP server somewhere. So what happens is that the phones are constantly in connection with the tower. Now this places them at the scene of the crime. And if they were present at the time of the crime, that helps a lot more because it you know, makes the uh, haystack size a bit smaller. We are looking for the needle in the haystack. So this really you know, helps us focus our uh, direction of investigation, so to speak. Now, uh, this data is collected not just for spots, which is like the crime scene, but also for routes and a complete list of cell IDs that, you know, uh, cover the possible escape routes, basically roads that come to and go from the school uh, uh, so that we are able to uh, identify people who left the crime scene around the time that we expected them to leave. Like, for example, uh, you know, uh, obviously when the child was picked up from in front of the school, nobody would hang around and sit waiting there, you know. Uh, they would, uh, you know, like that white wagoner in which the child was put, that uh, vehicle, uh, you know, moved away from the crime scene. Now, this vehicle would have also come to the crime scene and waited at the crime scene. So there is a road that may have come there. They may have, there is another road that may, you know, leave from there or vice versa, or they move, may have used the same route and whatnot. So all those perspectives will, you know, come into play. And since we know the time when the vehicle departed from there, we can actually look for, you know, uh, towers which cover that escape route. And here you can see this in the map form, what you see the uh, on the right-hand corner. 
and you also see the various linkages that are beginning to form with our first piece of information that we've got from the first event. And, uh, you know, this data is beginning to collect. So we're saying there's a vehicle, there are some people, uh, there are, you know, some mobile phones or SIMs that are involved and so on and so forth. So what is happening is here that we get a list of all the cell towers that cover that particular area and the request goes from the law enforcement to the cellular towers saying, give us a list of everybody who was present in that area between say uh, 1.30 and 2.30 p.m. On this, at the school site. And then from say uh, 2, 2.15 to say, you know, uh, 2.30 p.m. from the routes going away from there. And for the routes, you know, coming in, uh, say, you know, uh, from uh, uh, say 1 till 2 p.m. So, you know, now we have got three sets of data. We've got, uh, a list of all the cell phones that were present who came in. We have all the cell phones that were present who left. And we have all the cell phones that were actually present at the scene of the crime at the time of the crime. Now, this is one set of data and it is not, it is actually at this point of time, it is still a pretty big haystack because uh, these people, there are a lot of kids who study in that school. Then there may be a lot of people who come to pick up the child and this behavior would match the same as those people who come and pick up the child. But a lot of these people would be regulars, whereas some of these people are going to be new. And those are the people we are interested in. So this is, you know, uh, what we used to call uh, Venn diagrams, set theory. And we would use that to eliminate some of the numbers and reduce the size of the haystack. So this is the starting point. Now, you know, as I mentioned, the police goes about questioning uh, the child's friends and a lead is found as one of his friends saw him get in a white Wagonar car uh, that day. Wagonar is a particular model uh, from Suzuki. And the CCTV footage of the school uh, gate shows a white Wagonar at 2.10 p.m. passing by. So we look at that. And this CCTV footage is also picked up and put into the system. Now, what happens is that, you know, what does CCTV footage usually have? CCTV footage usually has... Uh, you know, uh, people, objects, uh, vehicles, and, you know, events or something happening, say a collision or somebody picking up a child and things like that. So what we are seeing here is that we have CCTV footage of the child, you know, being put into a car and being rushed away. And if you look at this picture, it shows us that there is a street that is going straight ahead uh, down and there is another street to the left. And, uh, you know, uh, typically crowded uh, environment and uh, number of vehicles are also parked there. So, you know, uh, it gives us a sort of a, a insight into what is happening. Now, what happens is there are a number of people also, you know, there are those makeshift shops sitting across. So you have people, there's a possibility that person may have sat across there waiting while uh, for the child to come out. So this is something that, you know, the is starting to build a picture for us. However, uh, the key thing in any kidnapping case is the recovery of the child. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, a lot of experience and research shows that if you can't recover a child within the first 48 hours, the, po the probability of getting the child back alive is very low. So, uh, you know, it, this is a crime where uh, solving it is, uh, so, you know, a life at risk crime where it needs to be solved in a really a very short time zone. So, uh, again, you know, as I mentioned, the video data is collected. Now, in the video, you will get a lot of faces, you will get number plates. In this case, not a relevant number plate, but definitely other vehicle number plates and things like that. So, this is the next thing. Now we move on to event two, the ransom call. Now what happens in the ransom call is that, uh, you know, the child has already been kidnapped. The same day in the evening when there's enough stress set in, you know, uh, 2 p.m. the child is kidnapped. By 6 p.m., the father of the child receives a call demanding money. The kidnapper demands one crore rupees, that's 10 million rupees. So the father says, look, I want proof of life. Is my child alive? They say, of course he's alive. Talk to him. And he speaks to his child and he's satisfied. And he says, sure, I will give you the money. You tell me where to drop it off. Now the kidnapper says, look, I will give, I will tell you where to drop it off. 
uh, later, you know, in another call. And uh, he says that don't uh, talk to the police and the usual stuff, you know. Now, the call in the meantime is traced back to a public call office, one of those coin pay booth kind of places where the uh, kidnapper made the call. Now, this was at a railway station and uh, the coin booth was actually not visible to any CCTV at that area. Now, uh, what normally happens is that when we are doing an investigation, what are we looking for? We are looking for faces. We are trying to identify people when we are looking for CCTV. So in such a scenario, uh, the CCTV uh, footage not being there is a bit of a problem. When we do have CCTV, we've already like saved one CCTV footage which we've got from the gate of the school. If we had gotten the CCTV footage from this location, we could have actually done a face matching exercise for both those CCTV footages to identify the presence of uh, uh, you know, a person who was common both at the kidnapping phone call location and uh, uh, you know, at the uh, kidnapping site. But in this particular case, CCTV did not work. However, there is definitely a cell tower in the area from where the uh, phone call was made, though it was made from a fixed line. So there is a possibility that this person had an active phone or person, oblique persons had an active phone with them and the active phone would have pinged one of the towers. So again, we use the cell site analyzer and we you know, ping the towers. And when once we ping the towers, what happens is that we get a list of all the cell towers that are present. We know exactly what time the call came. So we are sure that these people were present at that location at that time. Now, once we have a list of the towers that cover that location, we simply request the service providers to provide us a list of all the people who are present in those towers. And, and these can be, you know, tens of thousands of people. Normally, uh, you know, with a highly populated country like India, where there is a, you know, a very large population where everybody has, you know, at least one, maybe two cell phones. And uh, even, you know, the even a beggar has a cell phone. So it becomes, uh, you know, uh, uh, the possibility of or the volume of cell phones present at the crime scene is really high. So again, you know, but however, it's a starting point. As I mentioned, you know, it's artificial intelligence and big data. So this is what it is. Data is collected and it is again ap uh, added to the system to do the analysis. Now, what happens? As we start getting data, the system begins to start looking for commonalities. He says, all right, you know, there's this bunch of people present at the first event, a bunch of people present at the second event. And, you know, it starts plotting first and second event at, you know, at, uh, different uh, maps uh, on the map. Also looks at the possible routes, you know, that are joining them. And also says, look, who are the people that could be present in these events, you know, uh, based on telephone calls and things. Right. Now, again, you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, time is of essence because in this kind of a crime, your objective, primary objective is to recover the child. And then everything else is, you know, secondary after that. So uh, there is a link analysis that's going on of the tower data record. We have the two locations that are present, the place to the school from where the child was kidnapped and the uh, location where the ransom call was made, which was the railway station. We also have, uh, you know, a copy of the recording. Now, interestingly enough, you know, the father recorded the call on his cell phone when he got the call. And when he got the call, uh, this is also added to the octopus and it is stored in there. We get some metadata related to it, like date, uh, audio, frame size, frequency, whatever, all sorts of whatever information is available. And the key thing here is that it is kept as a reference for maybe doing a voice match at a later stage when we have voice samples of other people uh, if required. So uh, this is additional uh, storage of the um, um, evidence uh, for future reference in a single place. So that becomes easier. In the meantime, a third event happens. What happens is that you know uh, there is a parcel that is delivered to this person's house, the father of the child. And there are two people who come in masks. They, they come on a motorbike and they drop off a parcel at the doorstep of the child. The person, you know, picking up the parcel said that it had the smell of cow dung on it. You know, it smelled of cow dung. 
and uh, so the father you know he was uh, the guard at the gate or whatever he gave the parcel to the father and the parcel was open now there is a video from the gate camera which shows you know that these are the masked guys who came to deliver the parcel and things like that and uh, the parcel had a fake bloody finger and a pen drive and uh, the pen drive contained a photo of the kidnapped child and a pdf file with a message so the first thing was when the photo of the child was you know from the pen drive uploaded to the image module of uh, the octopus crime investigation platform it immediately in seconds you know going through the metadata came up with a latitude and longitude now the latitude and longitude is embedded in the camera or in the phone which takes it uh, if the uh, gps is on in this case the camera as we can see at the bottom it also detected the make and model of the phone it says that the Apple uh, phone was used an iPhone 13 Pro Max and it probably had the GPS on. So we have the latitude, longitude. Now this was taken to send a picture of the child. Now, immediately, you know, when this was done, the first action taken was, I mean, Octopus automatically places this on the map, the latitude, longitude. It takes the latitude, longitude and puts it on the map because it takes time for humans to, you know, figure out where exactly, but this will automatically do it. And uh, once we found it on the map, uh, uh, you know, police team was dispatched at high speed to, you know, try and recover the child from that location. And uh, unfortunately, when the team reached there, they had already gone. But again, it gave us one additional piece of information that these people were present at the time the photo was taken at that particular location. And once again, you know, the cell site analyzer was used to get a list of all the towers that cover the area and get a list of all the numbers. So now, as you can see, we are getting some lot of, you know, very large data, but we are getting uh, insights into who are the people present at these particular touch points or contacts, you know, or events. The second thing was the PDF file. Now, the PDF file had this content, you know, which said, "Agar dobara police ko contact karne ki koshish ki, to agli baar asli ungli hogi." So translated, this means that if you try and contact the police again. Uh, it's going to be a real finger next time. And the metadata when analyzed showed, you know, the author of the uh, PDF file. Again, this is, you know, sort of stored in the background uh, as information because there's not much we can do just knowing the name of the author. But uh, then again, you know, uh, at this, uh, this particular event location, again, you know, cell tower information is collected. And again, this data is analyzed and is added. In the meantime, you know, while uh, all these were going on, there was additional information that turned up from the uh, various uh, police stations around. And they, uh, there was a first information report which said that the uh, white wagoner was stolen from somebody's house uh, between 12 a, uh, midnight and 5 a.m. Now, uh, this particular piece of information, you know, the owner said that, you know, I'd gone to sleep at 12, I parked it outside my house and next day in the morning at 5 a.m. when I woke up, it was missing. So this is the kind of information. Now, this is uh, actually a pretty wide range. However, the thing is that, you know, between 12 a.m. and 5 a.m., there's not going to be a lot of calls. There will be a list of, uh, you know, towers that we can get. And once again, we get, you know, uh, towers from that area. And we also look to identify the uh, towers that are present. Again, in parallel, a motorbike was found abandoned near the school at a particular place. And it is basically the same bike that was used for delivering the parcel. Now here, you know, there was this fact that the tire of the bike had cow fodder all over them. In the meantime, you know, the tower uh, records of all the different uh, towers were checked and some common numbers were found. Now, ideally, we would have liked to find one common number which was present in all these different locations which would have, you know, nailed that person. But, you know, life doesn't work that way. So, uh, we got three numbers which were common in, you know, out of all these five or six locations. We had got one number which was common in two locations. We got another number which was common in two locations. And we got a third number which was common in another two locations. So, what we are seeing is that uh, a number of these, uh, you know, we've got some insights. And one of the suspicious numbers, last location, is a cow shed in sector 16. So now, obviously, you know, with the uh, cow dung smell from the parcel, the cow fodder over the tire of the bike, 
this is something that you know became a matter of interest for us so here as you can see here you know the analysis is done and you can see the common numbers on the right side at the bottom it says common in group 2 2 2 so their numbers and these are the you know different locations that are visible on the map so far so uh, we have the three events that have happened we've got the information that is added and the three telephone numbers whose data we collected once we load it into the system it builds this very nice peacock chart which shows the connections between these numbers themselves now these are the three numbers that are present and we're trying to see this so when we analyze this we find that one of the numbers is connected to both the other two people directly whereas one person over there is connected to the second person the other person via another two people as well so uh, one person is connected to both pretty thoroughly and uh, one person is you know got some intermediaries and uh, via the other one so anyway, uh, we get the from the service providers, we get these telephone numbers, and it turns out, you know, that one of them is named Mukesh, the other is named Suresh, the third is called Sarla, and Sarla happens to be the maid. If you recall, you know, at the first event, we had collected the persons of interest for us and all the people who worked uh, for the uh, family. So Sarla's telephone number is active in two of those locations. And it turns out that Mukesh is Sarla's husband and Suresh is um, uh, Mukesh's brother and owner of the cow shed. So, uh, case solved or not yet? Because who was Suraj, if you recall, you know, the document writer. Anyway, so what happens again, the team rushes to the cow shed to search for the child and uh, nobody is there. Only a phone is found with a broken screen. That phone is sent for further analysis. And physical and logical data is extracted from the phone. There is actually a picture inside. The, it shows an under construction building. Again, exif data is extracted from the photo. And the if, as you can see here, you know it is giving us the uh, latitude, longitude of the image. And it shows this under construction building here. And it shows that the phone that was used is one of those cheap Chinese phones, Infinix Mobility Limited kind of a thing. So once again, you know, the moment uh, this photograph is added to the, uh, the artificial intelligence automatically places it on the map and the team rushes to this location. And this is basically a graphical representation of everything that's happened. And a search of the under construction building is done. The moment the police reach the building, the child is found in an empty room at the top of the building. The white Wagoner car in which the child was kidnapped was also found in the backyard of the building. CCTV footage of nearby houses is extracted because there's no food CCTV cameras here. And a man is seen walking out of the building in one of the videos. Now face matching is done on all the relatives, friends, colleagues, suspects, rivals, etc. of the family. And a match was found and the man was arrested. So here we see, you know, the CCTV uh, footage of this man and this man is, you know, matched and on matching, we find that, you know, his face matches with the, uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, rivals of the family and ultimately, you know, the uh, uh, this complete, you know, case is solved. The child is recovered. These people are, the those three people are caught, the maid, the uh, brother, uh, uh, the husband of the maid and his brother and this guy, you know, the rival. And then, you know, there's the geographical different locations. This is a complete sequence of events from one to seven. And what are the outcomes? <coughs> the outcomes are that, you know, with a little bit of octopus marriage, uh, magic, uh, the child has been rescued unharmed, luckily. The stolen vehicle was recovered. The kidnapper was arrested. Two of the accomplices were also arrested and the maid was fired. So uh, that's it. It gives you an overview of what are the possibilities and what are the things that are happening. And I hope you found it useful. Connect with me if you like. We can talk more. These are my contact details. Thank you very much.